Well, hello everybody and welcome to another enthralling episode of the adventures of Dr. Douglas Gabriel and myself waiting in the wings and the interviews with an exorcist. And in this episode, we want to kind of take some of the threads that we've placed before you as of late and expand on them within the realm of personal growth and development. And we have kind of a, a really broad view of the matter because of our backgrounds, but it's interesting to us to be able to build bridges between traditions so that people can come to an understanding of how these things all come together. And one of the best people that I know in building a bridge between East and West is Dr. Douglas Gabriel. So with that being said, how are you doing, Douglas? Great, John. And uh, in the show notes below is an article that you caused me to have to write, which was the kind of connecting East and West, because for years and years, I didn't listen to you when you said, you know, look, you studied Buddhism now. I didn't want to, but I had to, uh, to be aware of comparative religions. And you said, you know, as an anthroposophist, you need to connect it up with Rudolf Steiner. And I said, well, you know, he wrote the, you know, a couple, I did a few lecture cycles and talking about Buddha and the principal position of Buddha, but I don't know. I don't know. And you've kept asking me to do it. And finally, I looked at it very hard, went through knowledge of higher worlds. Well, basically went through the um, path of, uh, well, the description of the path of initiation of Rudolf Steiner through his basic books, um, not only uh, called Science and Knowledge of Higher Worlds, but Stages of Initiation, um, and the three or four others, which are all mentioned in the article in the show, uh, which there's a URL in the show notes that connects you to an article. And that article was written for you. And, and I think there's a couple others somewhere. I couldn't find them this morning. But the point is, is that when you look at Rudolf Steiner, if in, you say initiation, then you're going to have to connect it to previous forms of initiation. So when I said that I was told again and again by uh, older Waldorf and anthroposophical people who had met Rudolf Steiner, uh, I'd say, you know, basically, how do you get initiated? I mean, okay, I've read these books, fine, yeah, yeah, I was clairvoyant, so I was already there. You know, the big deal is to read auras and colors, oh, whoo, whoop do No, that was no big deal. I wanted the deep stuff, you know, how do I get initiated? I want to be initiated. I want to go through some process that tests my mettle and my courage and my devotion and shows that I have done this pre-stages. You know, if you're going to get initiated, there's going to be a station, uh, a probation or a preparation or uh, austerities you have to go through usually or all kinds. So you can might have to wait <laughs> in some Tibetan uh, Buddhist initiations like Vajrayogini. You may have to wait multiple incarnations to get that initiation. They'll tell you this. And it's like, oh, wow. And then they give it to us Westerners, you know, and we have no clue what they're usually initiating us into, you know. But the point is, is that uh, there's a lot of forms of initiation and you do have to prepare for it. And so I this morning wrote down a few of the initiations because when I said all, all those people said Waldorf gardening and studying Rudolf Steiner's foundation stone meditation with the proper rhythms are all forms of getting initiated. But technically, just studying anthroposophy is a is a according to some Sergei Pagoviev, it's a new mystery initiation center, and so even in Steiner's view, he says you don't have to have of the three major ones he highlights. He says two of them you don't have to have a guru, but you do kind of have to have a, a guide or a friend, or you have to kind of have a source for your meditations on um, morality, so that you can train your thinking. Uh, but anyway. I thought I, I thought I'd jot this down, John. Now I'm sure that uh, yours is equally as long, the initiations you've been through, and I'm sorry to have to bore people, but just to give you an example of what not to do, <laughs> this is what you don't do. Okay, you don't 
treat initiation as a smorgasbord unless you're prepared to really, because every initiation is, is supposed to put you through, you know, a trial or four trials, earth, water, air, and fire. And who wants to go through that four times over every time you get initiated into a new group? And, you know, it's all, it's, it's basically in most cases, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade morality teaching, you know, and it's, I'm always into that because I, I was, I got a PhD in uh, comparative religion. So I'm always into comparing them. So here's a few of them. First off priesthood. Uh, I've been ordained a few times, so I guess that's an initiation because you got to lie down. They have to zap you with the Holy Spirit, the whole thing. Uh, okay, um, I got initiated into this one by somebody very famous. His name is John Barnwell, the playing cards. You attempted to initiate me into the mystic test book. I failed. So that was one of my failed initiations, right? Okay, astrology. Mm, people have tried to make me an astrologer. I just won't do it. You know, I, I don't conceive the world that way, nor perceive the world that way. But yes, uh -huh. Summit Lighthouse, I went through actually technical things, Aquarian Foundation. Of course, you know, with uh, Peter Kelly and those people and um, Galen Hieronymus, I went through the, what I'd call an initiation into radionics. I had to prove myself on all their devices. Uh, biodynamics, I was trained with the best and had to go through, you know, the yearly cycles of biodynamic uh, prep making and so on with Josephine Porter and Rosina Arn. Uh, masonry, the Blue Lodge, of course, reading all the other uh, degrees. Uh, in, uh, the Youth Circle, the pedagogical section of the anthroposophical section, this, you know, anthroposophical stuff, the high school of spiritual science, first class. The, I actually, unfortunately, I did. Yeah, I didn't mean to get into some of these things as deep as I did because, because I was so interested. I just, you know, they'd go, well, you, mm, you're not interested. Come a little closer. Step in this room. And then they'd have you, you know, read this book. And if you can answer the questions when you come back, we'll tell you more stuff. Uh, so that was the way it was with the Mormons, Swedenborg, the I Am Temple. Of course, you know, I went through the training with uh, with macrobiotics. So I, and then Hippocrates Health Institute with Ann Wigmore herself. Uh, EST with Werner Erhard himself. Uh, what's that guy? Tony, uh, well, Tony Buzan's memory training and all that stuff. Uh, what's the other guy? The NLP guy. I actually got to know him pretty well. The Holy Order of Man, yes, there was, there was official things there. Transcendental Meditation, once they give you your word, that's it. You just go meditate on that. <laughs> You're initiated. Here's your word, Ananda. Now, go. You know, oh, I didn't reveal that wasn't my secret word because in some of these you have to take vows and you have to promise and make blood oaths and swear that they'll cut your throat and they'll grab your heart out of your chest if you tell the secrets. Wait, John. Amorica, a theory society, Gaelic Rinpoche, a thousand, uh, and all these Tibetan Rinpoches, many, many initiations, Rosicrucian Fellowship, the Zen, Zen with uh, uh, with a number of different Zen teachers, Hare Krishna, School of Metaphysics, Pier Vilaya Khan, Theosophical Society, Co Masonry, Esoteric Section there, and the Liberal Catholic Church, to mention a few. In other words, don't do what I do. Do what I say. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, there's the wonderful story about Krishnamurti when he was a young man before he had met Annie Besant and Charles Leadbeater that he became interested in coming to America. And so he, he thought that he should meditate on it. And so what he was familiar with from America was the words Coca-Cola. And so he made that his mantra. And uh, apparently it worked because he did come to America. So uh, don't t limit yourself conceptually in these things. There's a, there's a power in focus. And the, but that being said, I think I have something here. Do I, is it really here or is it somewhere? Oh, I do. It says uh, uh, a dear friend of ours, uh, Ray Cardenas, he pulled out a quote from my book, wherein I say, I know it's difficult to be so gently attentive, but if in your inner work, 
you cultivate a profound stillness, you will find the strength that is needed sounding from within that silent word, which is gracefully resting like a swan upon the lake. And so there's a lot of imaginative things that one can approach that, that will give one the proper mood of soul to be able to enter into these things. And that I think is really key is because within that mood of soul, you're bringing in the level of higher feeling. And, and that is that elevated realm of the throat chakra and, and the principle of buddhi, which is uh, so critical in understanding the East that Douglas has studied so thoroughly. And so I think we're gonna explore the kind of variations on a theme here. Yes, and, and after all of that, and during all of that, I wanted to become a Waldorf teacher. So I gave up, uh, you know, being a priest. Uh, of course, I was ar already celibate, so it didn't matter. I wanted to be a Waldorf teacher uh, who was basically serving the community. Is uh, My title that I always like to end up getting is a helper. I, I like to help everybody. And so I started off for 11 years. I was at the Detroit Waldorf School training and working. I started immediately. I wanted to work with the children. And I had already done all kinds of strange training and placement with the um, other different uh, orders of priesthood that I was involved in, the three different orders. And so, you know, I joined the Christian community as a, I was a server. I was an altar boy. Here I was uh, living right down the street from the school and, and just having a great time, as we've described before, because the, on the weekends, I w would go to one strange place after the next, sincerely, and, you know, with a pure heart, just trying to figure out who are these people. And pretty soon, you know, I'd studied the world's religions, but I didn't know about all these cults. So I, I became very familiar with these cults. And sometimes I was asked to help people get out of the cults and to deprogram them deep brain unbrainwash them from uh, from the cult whatever you know uh, propaganda brainwashing so uh, as a waldorf teacher i thought that that was really the highest thing i could do so i gave up the catholic church i gave up uh so much of all all of those things and just focused totally on the fact that i was going to go through what i thought was the appropriate christian initiation because of this these remarks of these ancient anthroposophists who would say Waldorf teaching is the way to understand the etheric and to understand the etheric is to understand initiation. Just as a general note, the human I am works through the astral body and tries to work into the etheric body with new higher developed thinking and habits and sense free thinking through the sens super sensible organs of the first part that you develop when you go towards the spirit, which is your astral body. And that's the body of light. And no matter what process of initiation I've been through, it's all comes down to real, the same thing Steiner says, except that Steiner says it much clearer in modern terms and make sure that the Christian element is there because without that, if you go into the spiritual world into the etheric and you don't see Christ, you didn't go into the etheric. <laughs> it's as simple as that. It doesn't matter what path you're of, you're going to describe it. And when you describe it, someone like myself, as you're reading in the astral light, it's called reading. Steiner called it occult reading, occult hearing. And I just want to point out that in the basic books, definitely add that book because in there, he describes that these very stages of initiation, simple as can be. And in the article in the um, URL connection in the show notes below, I connected up to the Tibetan Buddhism showing that knowledge of higher worlds is basically the same moral, spiritual guidance that you could find in the highest Tibetan teachings called Lam Rin. And also in Bampo, the highest teachings called Lo Zhang or Dzogchen. And Steiner's ideas, they're the same moral development tuned to our time because those are old forms. Those old forms don't work. You have to be able to translate them and to do that. You have to enter into the consciousness of that time they were produced. But Steiner gave it to us in a, in a, in a tradition that we could do. And so what did he do? 
like all great spiritual teachers, what do they do to, towards the end of their life when they realize that they need to leave a legacy to prove that they're a great spiritual teacher? They create a pedagogy. And Steiner was asked to create the pedagogy. He could have created it long before. He made many uh, pedagogical statements before he started the Waldorf School. But essentially, when he started the Waldorf School, like um, any of them, you could make the whole list, including you know uh, uh, Krishnamurti and uh, Gene Gebser and uh, uh, William Irwin Thompson, and just on and on and on. Everyone has to lay out how they would teach children properly so that the spiritual would evolve upon building upon uh, the best parts of all of culture that have been developed over time. And so uh, in, in Kingfisher history, all that stuff, many of those things are taken directly from Steiner. So when Steiner is telling us in the Waldorf School how to deliver the world literature curriculum to children so that it's developmentally appropriate so that when the children hear these stories, it's like feeding a part of their, their soul that is so ready to hear this. And I know it's true because I've done it you know, so many times that you tell these stories and they take it like it's ambrosia and nectar. And, and they look so satisfied afterwards. And when they work through these things and they become Odin and Frigg, or they become, they choose which of the Norse gods they wish to become, or which of the Greek gods they be, they become, and make their own shield, and go to the wedding of Pele and the Thetis, uh, uh, um, you know, the wedding of the gods and the heroes, the uh, the mortals and immortals, all in Chiron's cave. You know, that that's what we did in fifth grade as a as a play together. We wrote it together. So when you're in Waldorf education, you are in the midst of the mystery centers. And the mystery centers of the past are taught through the cultural ages that Steiner called ancient India, ancient Persia, Egypt, Chaldea, Babylon, Greek, Roman, and Anglican, Germanic. And uh, now uh, those had to be in the Waldorf education crammed into the time when the child was ready to hear it in fifth grade. So most teachers can't get through fifth grade in Waldorf schools. Many of them collapse. They can't do sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. It's the most difficult curriculum you could ever ask someone to deliver on the face of the earth. Why? Because Rudolf Steiner wrote the curriculum and it's so difficult. It's, it is impossible to feel that you've done a good job, no matter how many times you've done it. Yeah. I was going to say the caveat is to do it properly. And uh, that's the real challenge, especially today where there's so many people that think that they can take the cliff notes of Waldorf education and build a school and, and carry it off properly. And, and that's just it, is that there's often uh, a lack of depth when people approach things. So they'll, they'll cast a wide neck like Douglas was explaining here, except he was patient enough to try and, and find depth in that, that broad net that he cast where he went to all those various different groups and systems of belief and all of that and tried to translate the nectar out of those various systems and see what what crossover points there are and it's important to understand also that the mythologic and and epic presentations that one meets through uh, an education system like waldorf or just a, an old uh, tradition of a folk is that these myths were created by initiated individuals, that the, the myths, legends, and fairy tales are the uh, hand down of the esoteric content of the various cultures. And in studying these myths, legends, and fairy tales, that what you do is you fortify yourself with imaginations that can blossom in future incarnations into the actual process of initiation itself, which is very much like what Douglas was saying about Tibetan Buddhism. Well, if you do this, then in future incarnations, you'll be able to do this other one over here. <laughs> that's quite a that's quite a thing. And uh, so go on, continue, please. Well, you said it so beautifully. It's exactly what you just said. The process of imagination that we're teaching the children from first through eighth grade, really first through seventh. But uh, 
what is that? That process of imagination, that's them developing their etheric body in relationship to human history. And so by the time they're done, they're universal, they're global. They know all the cultures. They speak uh, English properly, much better than I, I do. And they also speak to other languages. They're, they're completely fluent in, fluent in those languages and music and art and drama and uh, visual arts and architect, you name it. They, they have all the skills, they've been offered all the skills all the capacities that humans have and freely allowed to choose what they thought they should develop in this life. Not even what they've come in with last life because some come in with capacities, right? So in the study of man, which I, have, of course, trained teachers. <laughs> I tried the other day to count how many teachers have gone through uh, my classroom or, you know, that I've taught and uh, I, I can't even imagine. But in the study of man, it says that what we're teaching is what the child brings from their pre-birth condition. So what is that? That's their head. Their head is the action. It's the result of the actions of their willpower in a previous incarnation. So they come with this beautiful head and you can watch the teeth. And as you're watching the teeth come in and as you're watching the head change, sometimes it's shocking and then it comes down, gets caught in their throat and then they have trouble speaking. So that's why we do all the choral speaking and the drama and the singing. And then it comes down to the heart. And we've talked about the way that there's a physical heart, etheric heart, astral heart. And basically an ego that then right, resides there after you know 21 years of its own growth and development. And then we grow the spirit. So as you're watching this happen in a child over these years, I can now look back on these children that I taught. It was a great honor. Um, and so when I had committed to the initiation of Waldorf, I didn't know what I was getting into. And I assumed I was getting into the Christian initiation. Well, that is the way it turned out. But actually, I had hoped I was getting into the anthroposophic initiation, but it turned out to be the Christian initiation. And so the Christian initiation we're all familiar with, the, um, the uh, Via Della Rosa, the way of suffering of Christ. And it says that first in Steiner's version of this, the seven steps of initiation, that it's the washing of the feet. It's the humility. Well, as a Waldorf teacher, I knew I had to. Every child who came in, I may have to tie their shoes. <laughs> you talk about washing of the feet. Let me tell you about undoing knots of children's shoelaces, okay? When they invented Velcro, I tell you, some of us fell to the ground. You know, I don't know. People say it came from aliens. I don't know who it came from. But I thank the Lord for Velcro because I've done a lot of washing of the feet. Uh, literally, uh, because the children might take their shoes and socks off and go stomping or go play with the worms in the puddle. You know, anyway, uh, the scourging. I went, well, scourging? Why the scourging? Well, I was like the slave there for years before I became the first grade teacher. And you stay first grade through eighth grade with the same students. So I did everything. You know, I mowed the lawn. I cleaned things. I got up on the roof and fixed the slave. I did everything. I was just their slave. And I did it all for free. I never said that. I was a volunteer there. So I just showed up and said, what do you need done? And by doing so, then I knew the school inside out became invaluable. It's just a tricky way for us uh, guys to uh, make ourselves useful and then um, essential. So I went through the scourging because, you know, they treated me like I was dirt. I was also the librarian. I was this, uh, you know, every, everything, everything I've cleaned the, the bathrooms and the floors and the whole place. Whatever you can imagine. And then there comes the crowning of thorns. Well, I got tired. And when I did, as I was giving the, my uh, welcome speech to the children, we were doing this beautiful ceremony up on the stage. The stage caught on fire. Yeah, so in general, when you're getting initiated, you think you're going to like become the king. And then you find out they're go you're going to die in the process. And <laughs> or at least you think you're going to die. Many of the Masonic rituals, many of these rituals, which make they create morality training, is to make you awake to death. That's one of the first things that Tibetans teach you every day, 10 times a day. You have to say, I'm going to die. Make sure to make the most of this moment. And it wakes you up. But anyway, so yes, certainly there was the crowning of the thorns. As soon as I got hired, they put me in charge of everything for the whole time I was there finances, the building, everything, publicity. I went to all the big meetings and for, because they all knew I was Werner's student. 
And then I got to carry the cross. And the cross was the burden of people who hated me because I was um, efficient. No, I was probably very arrogant. And I was probably uh, very cocky and very uh, sure of myself because I didn't know what I was talking about, at least in terms of theory, in terms of, you know, cognitively. So, yeah, I had to carry a cross. And then, of course, uh, I was crucified. I was fired. And I was buried. I, I had to go sit in meditation for uh, about two months. And I didn't speak to anybody because I was told if I spoke, then I was guilty. And I was fired with no reason, as you know the story, John. And, you know, eventually what happens? And I was resurrected. Well, I was buried. So for a while, I went to Hawaii and did all kinds of other things, came back. And then in the end, they begged me to help them. And I was resurrected. Here I am teaching in the school that fired me. And the people who fired me can't tell me why they fired me. That's called Christian initiation. <laughs> now, did I really need to go through that? No, I wanted to go through anthroposophic initiation. That's what I thought I was there for. And that's this is what it sounds like. Seven stages. Okay. Study. Oh, I got that. I love I read every Steiner book I can get a hold of. I eat them up. Imagination. Oh, I have an overactive imagination. So I'm that's good, but it has to be morally centered. Take care for every step towards perception of the spirit, take three steps in moral development, Rudolf Steiner says. And then learn the occult script. That's called reading and writing. And that we put in this book. Tyler and I put in this book. Third volume of the Gospel of Sophia is called the, the Sophia Christos Initiation because it is a modern initiation and it teaches you different languages of the spirit, what's called the occult reading and occult hearing, but particularly occult reading for the 12, occult hearing for the seven. It's all in here uh, as an initiation process, uh, particularly focused on the feminine, of course, always in, in the Gospel of Sophia. It's focused on Sophia. And then you have to do number four of initiation, which is terrible. It's the one everyone fails at. I was going to say most people know. Everyone. A rhythmical life. Do the same thing at the same time, but with awakened consciousness each time, because you're doing the same spiral you did yesterday. Now, notice. Notice. See what's behind what you're projecting into the world and get your image of perception to merge with your concept and then let your ego decide what to do with that concept. It may be a useless concept, but this is the whole process that's going to happen with all initiation, whether it's a Tibetan, whether it's a general Buddhism, whether it's Hindu, whether it's a Persian or Greek or Egyptian, it doesn't matter. It all teaches the same thing, but you have to make it modern. So can I get a rhythmical life down when I became a Waldorf teacher? My life was so rhythmical, it was, I never missed a day of school, ever, ever. Why? Because the rhythmical life made my etheric body healthy. And that's what we're doing for the children, a rhythmical life. Once you get your schedule established, the children should know it because they should just, they don't need to look at a clock. We have no clocks in a Waldorf school. We can always tell you, though, when it's time for the lesson to begin, every child knows they're all sitting there working in their main lesson book. And two hours or hour and 45 minutes afterwards, they all just start putting their books up. And people in the room say, well, what are they doing? They know exactly what they're doing. Their inner timing becomes so amazing, it's ridiculous. That's the rhythmical life. I, I, so I worked on that. And then you have to learn about the macrocosm and the microcosm and the correspondences, what John and I often call cosmology. Oh, well, I'm down with that. And then contemplate the macro. I'd like to go there now. So I'm totally contemplating the macro. I'm, I'm in up there with the hierarchy. And then experience godliness. That's the initiation I thought I was getting into. I didn't know I had to be scourged and repeat the, the, the way of suffering. And yet so many Waldorf schools fire so the pillars, we'll just call them the pillars, the pillars of the school, they fire them. And they don't even give them a reason. This has happened so many times. The year they fired me, they fired two other people who were the pillars of the whole Waldorf movement in America, myself being included. 
and uh, some others. So they went around the Association of Walter Schools of North America, which I was very much a part of um, operating, especially the business management. They just, I raised money to get the, the, to people to get positions where they were paid. And what did they do? They went around destroying Waldorf schools. And who did they go after? The people they saw as their competition. So what is initiation? Initiation is the one we want to do, the one I just read. Do we want to go through Christian initiation? Some people do. And most of us have some part of that that happens to us consciously or unconsciously. But in general, we want to go through the one that is awake, that has to do with awakening knowledge, not just suffering. Yes. Well, you're not the, the, the normal example, I think. And so uh, sometimes it's good to bring these things down to earth and give people a few basic concepts that they can run with in their own cognitive, cognitive journey, as it were. But uh, in Rudolf Steiner's often giving you pertinent information in perhaps the most unlikely place. And so you could be reading a lecture on how to make a doll and all of a sudden he'll give you an important fact regarding cosmology that you've wondered about for many, many years. And so when Douglas brought up the subject today, I got to looking into it and I realized that Somebody had posted something on Facebook the other day that was pertaining to his lecture cycle on color. And I thought, oh, yes, that, uh, that's a really uh, an important concept to be able to, to contemplate. And, and that's the idea that as we receive light into ourselves, and it comes in through the senses, and, and Rudolf Steiner describes how it basically dies in our perception of it. And that were we to be able to enter into our thinking, we realize that our thinking arises to a large part from that life of the senses. And that were we to really observe our thinking, uh, we would see that it is light. Of course, we can't observe that light because it's who we are. And so we are utilizing the realm of thinking in a way in which we're unfolding this light. You're so right about that, John. It really does have to do with engaging the will and moving it from your willpower up into your thinking. And when that happens, we have intuition. And that really is the third stage of initiation. So it's, I, I like to keep it, out of the realm of the past, even though Steiner said there are three forms of initiation, uh, the ancient yogic path, which we've studied a lot uh, myself, and then the Christian path, which I described here, which is going to lead you to the way of suffering. Then there's the anthroposophic Rosicrucian path. And that's the one where you do the study and you develop your imagination, you develop the occult script, but it's just simpler than that. And so in Knowledge Higher Worlds and the Gates of Spiritual Science and other places, he basically gives you these six things. They're called the six basic exercises. And they're basically the same moral development that you'd uh, find in what's called Sutrayana. There's four stages of, of yoga, Sutrayana, Mantrayana, Vajrayana, Tantrayana. And they're all the same thing Steiner gives us. But to begin with, you have to control your thinking, control your actions, you have to see that you have thinking, feeling, and willing and learn to balance them. You have to become optimistic and trust the universe. You have to have freedom from pre prejudice, in, in other words, impartiality, and basically equilibrium. Now, that can also be simply right guidance, moral strength, inner purity, power of observation, patience. These are all the kind of things that you'd find in any, you can look this up, in Wikipedia and say, what are the stages of initiation? And most of these will come up. But remember Steiner's occult science was also called initiation science, or and there, he has a whole bunch of books where the word initiation is used in there. So what is it that he's talking about? He's talking about 
developing new super sensible organs that can perceive in the spiritual world and with sense free thinking. But until you become able to observe your thinking, you're not ready to proceed on the path of initiation. So when you can observe your thinking, that's what Steiner would call enlightenment. When you realize that your thoughts can link with higher beings who have thoughts that are passing through you. And when that happens, basically that is then the beginning of enlightenment. And then you can, on your own, take your spiritual body and your soul, which is your astral body, and merge it with your etheric body and your physical body. And when that happens, the astral body touches the etheric body, and it is right then that if you can be awake in the astral light to look at your etheric body, you see the guardian of the threshold, you see your three doubles, and it is the process of initiation that you really don't have to have anyone guide you through it anymore because we have as humanity been drawn across the threshold. So everyone's getting initiated. So if you, you can study the greatest, deepest stuff, and it's going to come to the same thing Steiner tells you, and it comes to these five things. And the first two are just part of preparation. And then the other, and then through them, you're supposed to get enlightenment. And then the last three. And this is Zogchen. This is the simplest path to enlightenment that I know, is to say these five phrases and understand what they mean. And it's in the it's in the article below. Vision is mind. Mind is empty. Emptiness is clear light. Clear light is union. Union is great bliss. It's the same thing as Steiner says, you get your ego and then you develop imag moral imagination, moral inspiration, moral intuition. In other words, uh, as they say in Tibetan Buddhism, once you come to this emptiness, that's who you are. You're this empty vessel for all these things to happen in. And then what happens? You sit back and you watch the lights, the sound, and the creative word. In other words, imagination, inspiration, intuition. So enlightenment is not this gigantic goal, as Steiner points out. So Buddha reached enlightenment. There were two stages higher than that. Uh, and we can all reach them. And it's very simple. And it, it just has to do with what you need to get to the place that you're empty enough to listen, to see, to listen, and to actually communicate. And that's, he calls, the language of the spirit. And it's the same thing in every path that I've ever studied, every single initiation I've been in. It always comes down to thinking, feeling, and willing, and turning them into higher thinking, feeling, and willing. Yes, and, and to kind of fill that in with a, a couple of the ideas out of uh, Rudolf Steiner's lecture course on color, thought and will is light and darkness. And in there, he makes some very, very uh, potent remarks. And those are, are from a lecture from the 5th of December, 1920. And it's collected edition 291. But I'm just gonna read a short sentence. Being thinking men, we live in light. We see the external light with physical senses. The light which becomes thought, we do not see because we live in it. Because as thinking men, it is ourselves. You cannot see that which you yourselves are. If you emerge from this thought and enter upon imagination, inspiration, you put yourself opposite to it and can see the thought element as light. So there you have it in, in a, tremendous thought that you can ponder is that the reason you don't see the light is because you are the light. Vision is mind. When you, when you comprehend that, you go, vision is mind. What do you mean? You mean my thinking is simply something that arises from vision. So that's just perception. Correct. We don't see to the other side of what's behind perception. So right there, you got to stop right there. Vision is mind. Well, when you get become objective in your thinking, then you can start to see behind things. And that's, that's the first stage. 
And then what's the second? Mind is empty. Uh Uh-oh, all that thinking I did, and now I need to let it all go so that a real thought can come in. That's what will happen. You know, they go, Tibetan Buddhism, uh, meditation on emptiness, my mind's empty all the time. No, it's not. You're all the time running your little thing, you know, about your little habits and your next needs and your next desire and blah, blah, blah. So no, it's not. But once you get to emptiness, and then emptiness is clear light. Uh Uh-oh, there's the light. Bingo, the light. You just simply sit back and watch the images. And then you start to find out if some of those images are real and there's beings behind them and forces behind them or if they're just your imagination, your fantasy. And then clear light is union. What does that mean? It makes you so happy. It, it makes you union with what? With inspiration. You, you know, it's the second stage of Steiner's initiation of your spirit and it, inspiration. And then union is great bliss. What is great bliss? Great bliss is when you have an intuition, because when you have an intuition, the creative word speaks through you, you become it, it becomes you. You think you said it, but it actually said it in you. You didn't invent it. Why? Because it's absolutely 100% correct and you're just a human. You probably didn't come up with the intuition. So when when really, when this this moment happens, it's the greatest bliss and they're, that's what they're aiming at. But are they dancing and and doing uh, dances and having a party and wearing a party hat. No, no, they're not. They're in absolute silence because why? This is the knowledge path. This is the path that's going to awaken what Steiner calls intellectual clairvoyance. And so that's the path that we're supposed to be following now. We don't need to follow the old paths of yoga. I spent a lot of time looking at that stuff. It will give you the same content, but it won't give it give you the right perspective. Or you can go the Christian path. And some people, that's plenty for them. So every single person out there, every single person out there, all you'd have to do if you wanted to become enlightened and initiated is realize that your mind is incredibly powerful and then meditate on the life of Christ. So Douglas and I, when we set out to create this learning space in the internet, wanted to make it fun for you. We wanted to model it after the process of initiation. So we call this uh, experience the glass bead game. And many of you know why, and you know Herman Hesse wrote this book and about the glass bead game. And, and really you're guided through the process through the things that interest you. And we put out so many articles and videos not just from the political geopolitical world, but also from our anthroposophical experiences. And as you move through the things that interest you in our glass bead game, we ask you to contribute back, leave a remark, reflect upon your own experiences so that the next traveler that comes to this internet space is enriched even further. And it's been such an amazing experience to see people who first started with us when we were Betsy and Thomas way back in the day, just you know, taking apart the swamp to seeing the people that were responding to us then that now are reading and listening to Steiner. It's just incredible because the glass beef game will take you, it will direct you there. And so in a way it's your invisible um, teacher. We're your invisible teachers and John's included in on that. Douglas, please, before I, when I get off, say a few things about the glass bead game as an initiation experience for the adult. Okay, uh, Herman Hesse, love, love his works, read all of them. He actually was introduced to by email, email Molt to Steiner through the, uh, Emil Molt was the founder of the Walter School. And of course he uh, won a Nobel prize for his writing and he wrote the glass bead game, which is his ultimate, as I said, anyone who thinks that they are, you know, really a great teacher, what do they have to do? Create a curriculum. So what is the glass bead game? So the glass bead game, is really the greatest philosophical expression of intuition. Because what's supposed to happen in it is there's this uh, Castalia, this community of great thinkers, and each of them are a master in their area. But once in a while they get together uh, for a big festival and they bring all their knowledge together and they put it all together right in front and the master of the glass bead game, the Magister Ludi conducts it and then Everyone gets wisdom by seeing the synthesis of science, art, and religion, and everything else. But basically, it's 
the greatest thinking that you can do and the greatest uh, manifestations in the world all being basically spelled out in a script that is also musical, historical, philosophical, ar it includes architecture, includes all branches of science. And so when we said we were doing the glass bead game, it was because we knew that out there in, in the listening world are a bunch of geniuses. And so if they want to participate, they can come and offer their glass bead and it will be put into the way that the glass beads are arranged so that it then spells out truth, the truth of our time and also the truth of the future. So the past, the present, the future. Basically, the glass bead game is a philosophical book of revelation. And it's, a, it's an amazing thing, all the people who participated over the years, we didn't ask people to do a lot of the stuff that they come in and they do wondrous things to support the work um, of basically bringing forth initiation science, spiritual science. So uh, the Waldorf curriculum is the glass bead game. It is the glass bead game. And the Waldorf teacher is the Magister Ludi, is the, the master of the glass bead game. And essentially, that a process is a continuing initiation. Once you've reached the enlightenment that the curriculum is the path, then you enact it. It takes eight years to enact it uh, in one cycle. And even then you have to do it over and over again because every single time it's brand new and you have to be brand new every day. And so it calls on you to go through the challenges, the trials, the tribulations, the preparation, the austerities, uh, the moral development, uh, everything is all rolled up into the Waldorf curriculum and the challenge to the Waldorf teacher to deliver this to the child's etheric body because you, according to one of the major educational principles of Steiner, it is the body above the body you're teaching. So if we're teaching the child's etheric body, that is the body of the teacher's astral body that teaches their etheric body. My etheric body does not teach their etheric body. My astral body teaches it. My ego will teach the astral body of a teenager after age 14. So this is what we have to remember. The Waldorf teacher must tame their astral body or they cannot interact with the child's etheric body in a rhythmical way to create habits and forms of uh, allowing the child's own pre-birth etheric body to come in and to bring the wisdom that will happen in every single classroom presentation I ever did. I swear to you, I got more than they got out of it. So, and there you have it. I remember reading Magister Ludi by Herman Hesse, the, the glass beat game back in the 1970s. And I thought it was a truly remarkable work. And it gives one pause because it, it, for many people, it showed them that there was something more than what they had been told thus far. And so hopefully that's what we're doing here is taking up the opportunity to show you that there just might be something more than what they told you at school. And so I want to thank Tyla for uh, being such a, a stalwart warrior in this uh, search for truth and for being able to make these things possible. And I want to thank, of course, Dr. Gabriel for his breadth of experience and depth of knowledge. And I want to thank everybody for coming to visit us once again. And may your life path be blessed. <laughs>